welcome to the Built on Air podcast, the variety show for all things Airtable. Each episode, we cover four different segments. It's always fresh and different and lots of fun while you get the insider info on all things Airtable. Our hosts and guests are some of the most senior experts in the Airtable community. Join us live each week on our YouTube channel every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern. And join our active community at builtonair.com slash join. Before we begin, a word from our sponsor, OntoAir.com. Any business running on Airtable gets the value that Airtable has, but also needs a few more functions to complete their operations. That's where OntoAir comes in. It's a suite of tools for any business running on Airtable to maximize your operations efficiencies and automations. One customer, John, states that OntoAir enables his business to function properly without having to think about building their own software. And that is pretty invaluable. The OntoAir Airtable apps are amazing and we use them often and are very happy with the results. So join John and hundreds more customers and take your Airtable to the next level with OntoAir. Sign up today with promo code BUILTONAIR for a 10% discount. Check them out at OntoAir.com. And now let's check out today's episode and see what we built on air. All right, welcome to the Built on Air podcast. Good to have everyone with us again. Season 10, episode 11. We've got myself, Dan Fellers, and Ali Yolosa with us today. Hello. Welcome, Ali. Thank you. And- and it's just going to be the two of us today. Camille couldn't uh, make it this week and we didn't have a guest to join us. So couldn't uh, make it this week and we didn't have a guest to join us. So Ellie and I are going to hold down the fort, talk about all the fun things going on in the Airtable world. We'd love to uh, hear from you. Feel free to comment. Scott, welcome. Glad to have you on with us. <laughs> Always good to have live participants. So give us your feedback as we go through this. So as always, the Built on Air podcast is a weekly live episode, uh, typically about an hour long. We go through four different segments. I'll go through briefly what we're going to be covering today. We always start off with round the bases, talking about what's going on in the Airtable community. Then we'll do a spotlight on Onto Air, our primary sponsor. Then Ali will go through a case for Interface with us, uh, learning more about interfaces. Then I'm gonna do a scripting time, go through some scripts and how to improve your scripting skills. And then a highlight on this community built on air. And then finally, we'll end with an audience question, learning about automation emails and whatnot. So with that, we will get started on round the bases. So we always like to learn about what people are discussing in the different communities in the Airtable ecosystem. And we always typically start off with Airtable's community. So first we have the big oops. <laughs> so if you were with us last week, I'm gonna blame it on Ali since you did the demo. <laughs> Fair enough. And actually, I thought it was funny because you had said at the beginning of that episode, you were like, Ali became an expert in this in 30 minutes so we could share this demo with you. And the second paragraph here, I was like, oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. So last week, if you watched our episode, we discovered it's like every Tuesday morning, it seems like Airtable is when they push out changes. And last Tuesday, we woke up to a brand new feature uh, that was available and we were all excited about it. Ali did a demo of it, and it was basically the ability to edit um, records in a shared view. So you could share a view, and the end user who didn't have to be logged in or anything could edit the information um, in line inside the shared view. And so it was pretty cool. Come to find out, that was a big mistake on Airtable's part, and they had to apologize for it here. And yes, definitely a big oof. Jalen, welcome. Glad to have you. Hi, and <laughs> so Jordan had to take the brunt of uh, the backlash that followed. Um, lots of people not happy at all with this. So we need to apologize. We left it out there. So if you wanted to see what that feature looked like, feel free to review um, Ali's demo from last week. Um, but unfortunately, 
it's not no longer available unless you enabled it and used it in that couple of hours when it was live. Um, they took it back. And the worst part is it doesn't sound like it's ever going to see the light of day <laughs> based off of Jordan's comments. Yeah, I think I think I'm hopeful, though, because I, I think they know it's it's something people want. And I'm sure that they know that even more than they did before now, based on the backlash and the excitement um, based mm -hmm. on the initial feature when we thought it was real. Um, I'm hopeful that in the future they'll be coming out with something probably in a more scalable fashion than even that feature, because that feature, you know, it's a little scary, a little dangerous in the wrong hands. If you set it up wrong or you forget it's out there, then you never know. So hopefully we'll we'll see something with a little bit more robust permissioning in the future. Yeah. 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 A lot of people upset. We weren't the only ones. I know other people, Gareth, I think, did a video and sent it out to his large network and um, others shared it with their clients or newsletters and, and then had to backtrack. So a little bit of a mistake. Um, somehow the somehow that feature got turned on for everyone and um, was not meant to happen. So, uh, yeah, they talk about um, kind of how like they re they really need to figure out the permissions. And it sounds like they're working on that. And it's a bigger picture um, vision of what they want to do um, with permissions. And this all plays into that. So something, you know, eventually they'll they'll launch kind of a new permission based approach um, to everything. And we'll see how that all shakes out. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you want to see upset um, customers, feel free to <laughs> review um, this list. And yeah, it's it's a long, long, long list of unhappy people. Unfortunately, that seems to happen <laughs> far too often in this ecosystem. <laughs> so. Oops, sorry. We were we were we weren't the first to break it, but we were probably the first to you know kind of publicize it on a bigger uh, stage and and get the word out there. So, um, but it was live. <laughs> <laughs> it was out there to use, so we we went for it. We like to see every Tuesday morning what what might be new out there. So. I didn't see anything new this morning, so I don't I don't uh, think there's any secret features we can share today. <laughs> Same. Yeah. All right. Moving on. Um, go to uh, Reddit. So on Reddit, I thought this was a good uh, question. It was, what was your aha moment with Airtable when you knew that the product was different or useful? I thought that was an interesting question. Everybody kind of has their their aha moment. I don't know, Ali, if you can remember a specific kind of aha moment you had with Airtable. Definitely. I mean, originally when I first found it, and I'm sure this is similar to the experience of many people, like I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. It's just a fun like UI to use to organize things. Um, but when I finally put, I, I excuse me, I finally put, <laughs> I said, I finally put my family business's inventory into Airtable. And one of the salesmen asked like, hey, can we get an email when this happens, when a certain thing happens? And I was like, well, hmm, let me try and figure that out. And that led me to figuring out Zapier. And then I was like, oh, wow, like you can build whole apps and processes out of this. Like it's not just a spreadsheet. It's not just to organize things. Um, so yeah, that was definitely my aha moment. Was, was that your, was that your kind of role to like, manage the processes or did you just kind of stumble into that no my role was marketing manager <laughs> and i was helping like we have we sell big trucks like kenworth trucks and i was trying to help our sales manager like wrangle where all of the unit pictures were so we could put them in the ads and so then i found when i found Airtable, i was like oh this is actually perfect for that and it ended up working not just for advertising but also as a hub for our salesmen to see what we have in stock and share with their client uh with their customer base so it was really cool yeah yeah that's that's cool how and it's changed your 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 career trajectory <laughs> literally like here i am like five years later i'm like what happened 
<laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. so happy. It's awesome. Yeah, that is cool. Yeah, let us know if you're listening live what your aha moment was with Airtable. Um, always kind of cool to hear. For me, I was um, so I was running a, a dev shop, so we were were custom. My background's in software development, and we were doing um, custom software development. And I had actually kind of built my own platform from scratch that um, wasn't it wasn't like an Airtable clone or anything, but it solved a lot of the same problems. And it was, um, you know, and I had I had customers, but it wasn't the business that I wanted it to be. And so I was kind of looking to branch out and do more stuff. And I, I don't remember how I found Airtable, but um, when I came across it, I just saw the vision. And this was before automations, before scripting. And just the ease of use of a relational database, you know, I, you know, I'm, I have a degree in computer science. And so I know how relational databases work and, and, um, and whatnot, but just how they made it so easy to use and engage with, I saw the potential of it. And it was like, this is, this is different. And then, um, and then as I've gotten into it, what I've really realized is what's so unique about Airtable is the users, the, the passion that people have, like how it changes, like you as an example, like I've seen that over and over. And if we've done this podcast and interviewed people that use it, like it has a very passionate user base, um, which is unique for, for business software. Um, so that, that was the, uh, that was kind of the second aha moment of like, wow, there's something really different here. And I hope that that continues. I know I'm very vocal as others in this community are to Airtable that they don't lose that special, unique, uh, magic that, that they've been able to garner somehow. Um, but yeah, there's, those are kind of my aha moments. I'll share a few here. Hannah was tracking her plants and flowers. That was kind of when <clears throat> she had hers. So <laughs> Scott, very passionate as well. Yes, definitely. We love to hear Scott's voice. And we've got Jen with us. Uh, more powerful Lego piece for placement agency systems. Trying to build a deep information-based business without a database was madness. So she saw the power of it in her business consulting. And uh what not there. So yeah, it's kind of cool to think everybody has kind of a unique story of, of how they use their table and uh, which also makes it very, that's another aspect is like everybody comes from different perspectives because their table has such a broad appeal and, and usage that we have very differing stories. We're not all in the same industry and same use case. Yeah, that's something um, I love so much about it. Like every client I talk to is from a different industry, totally different use case, different thing they want to do. And it's so cool to get to learn about all of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and Scott, I remember Scott shared this. Scott's been on our show and shared it. his backpacking trip through Europe with Airtable. That was his aha moment coming from other uh, systems. So yeah so cool feel free to continue sharing we might uh post them later in the show as they come in uh we'll move on another one from the reddit community um another um this seems to come up quite a bit so reoccurring tasks i think was it even last week that we talked about this there's another question uh this week and oh yeah so this was actually now i remember correctly this is actually a follow-up to a previous question so that's a common issue, reoccurring tasks. Um, we, we gave a couple examples last week or maybe two weeks ago. Uh, but this person uh, actually made a video with a demo tutorial of how you set up reoccurring tasks, the fields that you would need, the formulas for the date, and the automations to set up reoccurring tasks. So if, um, if you need reoccurring tasks, this link here will take you to a YouTube tutorial that will walk you through that. So I thought that was worth sharing. Shout out to Fungal Mir. <laughs> <Who posted that? laughs> hey, Fungal Mir. <clears throat> All right, moving on. We've got a uh, Facebook community, um, the Airtable community on Facebook. 
quick question surrounding automations with the ability to now have conditional steps in the workflow. Do each of these conditions count as an action towards the max of 25 per automation? Uh, so I thought this was worth sharing. There's a little more example of, I think that's important to know what's, what's your understanding of limits on automations and the new conditional. Um, I am not a hundred percent clear. I haven't looked into it all the way yet, but my assumption would be that it would function the same way as Zapier where you could set up paths and, you know, filters, but it only the ones that run are going to count towards that step um limit yep. but yep. i'm not 100 percent sure on that yeah that is yeah so they so so they don't they don't count each um step like zapier does so they just count each automation run um, towards the automation limit oh right but there right. is but there is a limit on the number of steps that you can create and I know before conditional logic, when it was just a straight list, it was 25, right? I think so. So you could have 25 different um, steps created. Mm -hmm. With conditions, I believe when it came out, I did a test. And I know within one condition, I was able to create 25. Okay. And so I don't know if it's 25 per condition block right. or if it's 25 total across um i think kavan did kavan answer it i'm sure kavan knows the answer to this that's more on the uh that's more on the record limit um yeah and if you know in the comments let us know yeah so it's 25 actions per automation i believe that might be across all uh conditional blocks um or it might be 25 per block um that might be something we can test and, and share next week yeah that's so. interesting i'm not sure but that's so so it is indeed the the automation run so even if you have 25 steps that still counts as one run towards yeah. that fifty thousand. yeah that yep. okay cool. yeah yeah, so you got fifty thousand. So that that's one good benefit of yeah, Airtable versus you know Zapier. They count each individual step, but Airtable doesn't. Um, it's just one one full run through. So that's awesome. Yep. So that's worth understanding, especially if you're building automation. And then the number of automations is also twenty five, right? So yes. you can have tw up to twenty five automations um total mm -hmm. and maybe that will increase in the future but that's where it's at right now all right one more from uh from um the Airtable community i know this uh erica put this um we're sharing so um zapier is doing a um contest a contest yeah are you familiar with it yeah, the low, low code innovators contest, I think, is what they called it. And it's like a twenty-five thousand dollar cash prize, as well as a call with the CEO. Um, pretty cool stuff. I was looking at the entry form the other night. Yeah, are you gonna submit? I think so. Why not? I'd love to. Yeah, go for it. Interesting. Yeah, that'll be cool. Um, so it's it's hosted by Zapier, um, you know, it touches. So they're going to get a lot of entries from different systems. They kind of touch everything, mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's going to be some Airtable specific ones. So we'll keep an eye on this if there's anything. Uh, so even in their example, Kenan Salil used Airtable and Zapier to scale his company. So there's even a, the example they share is Airtable related. Mm -hmm. um, so apparently there's a national no code day what day is that yeah that's awesome i think it's oh um, march 11th so we just missed it <laughs> <laughs> all right so march 11th apparently is national no code day so happy national no code day four days late <laughs> i dig it all so right 
April 13th is the call for entries, is when that closes for this contest, it looks like. Yeah. So apparently Zapier just made that official March 11th is National No Code Day. So, all right. <clears throat> So yeah, check that out. We love it. If anybody in our community is is um, submitting something, let us know. Uh, post it in the Slack, and and we'll share it with everyone. And if there's any kind of voting mechanism, we'll be sure to help you out. So Ali, go for it. Excellent. Which, uh, all right. Moving on. Let's go to uh, our built on air community. Um, there was a, a, a new thing, Hannah, who is with us this morning, um, found a new feature. Well, kind of, uh, this is relatively minor, but when you're sharing uh, a base, they have a new kind of interface of how you do it. Um, and I don't think this is live for everyone. Um, I don't think I've seen it on mine yet. I'm looking right now to see if it looks like that for me. Yeah, let me see. So yeah, I've still got the old one here. So they might be A-B testing this new one. Mm -hmm. So if you're seeing it, um, kind of looks like this. So kind of got the sidebar on the left for base and view. And then the email, create link and share publicly. So it doesn't look like any new functionality other than this um, you can invite them to all bases. So I assume that would make them a workspace share. So it's kind of a shortcut. Yeah, I think that, exactly, right? Like I think it, when you go to hit the share button now, instead of going right to the screen or the, the screen it used to look like, I guess, it would show, you know, base or workspace. And maybe they're just mm -hmm. giving you another opportunity to, to toggle that um, yeah. as well as putting in the view and making sure you're aware of all the view links that are shared. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that might be, um, yeah, Hannah, let us know. I Actually, I can tell based on who it's shared with. That's that's one of our bases, but I'm not seeing that. So <laughs> that's weird, even in the same base. Let me see if it's in this one. Yeah, this one's still old for me. So even assuming it's this base. Um, <laughs> might be uh, in there. So interesting. Anyways, yeah, that's kind of cool. That's that's kind of the only new thing that, that we've seen this week that is actually still with us a week later, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe this one got pulled back as well. Hannah, let us know if you still can see this. <laughs> All right, the next one I'm gonna hold off. So that kind of uh, wraps up our community update on round the bases mm -hmm. and um, what's new and what we can share with you. So we'll move on to onto air. Onto air is our primary sponsor. It's an all one toolkit to run your business on Airtable. It's a suite of apps that allows you to uh, do lots of different things. And in today's spotlight, I'm going to focus on using our onto air actions product which is a library of um, predefined functions that do a variety of things. One of those things is we have deep integration with the Google Suites, so Google Docs, Sheets, and Slides to populate them, create workflows with your Google Docs, Sheets, and Slides, and using Airtable as kind of your workflow to populate them, either using them as a template or whatnot. <clears throat> And I'm gonna show real briefly on how you integrate with our Google Docs integration. So the use case for this would be like a sales invoice or a template, and you wanna populate it with Airtable data. Some of the cool things is with this, you can actually generate tables in your Google Docs that's, do that's populated from a linked um, record field that has multiple and it will go on multiple pages. So if you have a lot, that's one of the restrictions of page designer is that it won't expand beyond multiple tables. So you can do that in Google Docs and it will create a copy of your template. And then you now have a working Google Doc that maybe you can modify and whatnot. So it's not just static built into some kind of editor view. Um, you actually have a living 
document that you can then um, tweak, which is pretty common in, in many workflows that you create a template, you populate it with your initial data, and then maybe you have to add some custom uh, text to it. Mm -hmm. And I just want to highlight, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you just kind of set it up, you connect it to your Google um, environment. And then we have the ability to, you can use, you can use this as just a way to create blank documents every time a new record is created and you just want a blank Google doc and you can um, link it right into that record. It will save the URL and then you can interact with it. So it's a great way to just automate just every time there's a new record created, I want to just create a new Google Doc that I'm going to use for notes or anything like that. That's one use case. Or you can use a single template um, or you can use dynamic templates. And what that means is you can actually specify a field in your Airtable. So maybe it's a select field or a formula field that's derived off of um, your record data. And you can use that to basically um, pick which document you want to use depending on the variable value. So it doesn't have to be just one document for every record. You can actually have different documents created for each record depending on the, the select field or the formula field or whatnot. So you would just type in what value it is and then select the template that's associated with that value in that field. And then every time this automation runs, it will look at the value in that field and then determine which um, Google template to use uh, to generate your output. And then you can pick which folder to save them in. You can also, um, so if you're populating it from data, you can set up the, the merging of your data from Airtable into the document. Um, or if you don't need that, then there's no field merge. And then finally, you can export the Google Doc as a PDF um, or as an HTML or text or even Microsoft Word file and save that as an attachment back into Airtable. So very powerful workflows. Um, we have one client now that has 200 different template types depending on the different value. And so they have 200 different Google documents. And so this is really powerful to be able to do that kind of workflow. So check out OntoAir, OntoAir.com. Um, this is inside of our OntoAir Actions product, which has a lot more functionality beyond this. So check it out there and let us know how you're using it. All right, let's move on to a case for interface. I'll show your screen, Allie. All Go right. For it. Excellent. All right. So I'm just going to do a very quick demo here on an approach to let you add new records while you're working in an interface. Um, and this is something that maybe hopefully very soon will become obsolete and you won't have to do this because Airtable will let you do it natively, but currently you can't. So until that day comes, here's a little workaround that you can try. Um, so here I've just pulled down the template base uh, project tracker. Um, and I just set up a very simple interface using that record review um, option where I've got my projects and associated tasks underneath. But if you notice here that this there's just a little lock symbol instead of where that plus symbol would be in the native app. Um, and it, if you mouse over it, it says this feature is not currently available in interfaces. So until that becomes available, we want an easy way to be able to add tasks here so that you can actually do your work from within the interface. Um, so a solution that I have for that is I'm going to add a single select field at the project level. So whatever table is the parent of the linked records that you want to add. Um, and you could use this same like hack, so to speak, um, not just in the record review, but basically for anything, you just would want to figure out where to put the single select. Um, and we'll talk more about that after. So I'm going to call it actions. And I've actually, this idea was heavily inspired by something Kavan showed right after interfaces came out. Um, 
and I'm just going to write like add task as one of my options. And so I'm calling this actions because maybe later on I want to add other actions to this and maybe trigger different automations based on what's chosen. Um, so I could add a task or maybe I want to say like delete project or delete something, um, whatever you want to do. So let's just say that's at add task so that we can create our automation. And I'm going to go define a custom automation and I'm going to call it add tasks to projects. And the trigger is going to be when a record matches conditions on the projects table, design projects, so to speak, I guess. And I'm going to say when actions is add task. Test that to pull in my test record. And I'm just going to have a create record step as my first action on the tasks table. And the only thing I'm going to fill in is the design project link field so that I know that this task becomes linked to the project that I wanted to add it to. So in order to do that, I'm going to choose design project on the tasks table as the field I want to fill in. And then I'm going to choose the record ID of the project that triggered this automation. So that should go ahead and create a new task. I'll test that action. And then finally, I could leave it there, but if I want to get a little fancier, I'm going to then go back and update the record on the projects table to clear out that actions field. So that way I can do it again if I want to. And to clear this out, um, I tested this the other day. In Zapier, if you put three spaces, that will clear out a field. And apparently yeah. the same thing actually also works in Airtable. So wow. if I put three spaces there and then test it, we'll see this just go to blank. And there's a little trick for you if you didn't know that. I just figured it out Will myself. It really not work with two spaces? Actually, I didn't try it. <laughs> I just I active. wonder if even in one space would do it. Yeah, let's do that now, actually. <laughs> well, no, I should shut this off first. <laughs> let's just set this to add task. And then let's do All right, just one, two spaces. Oh, I guess two spaces works too. Does one space work? I was already blank. Yeah. 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 All right. So any amount of spaces works apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so did so it uh, actually pick your drop down from actions? Did it create no an extra? No, it didn't. Okay, good. I wonder if I had one in there though, because sometimes I've actually seen people do this where they have just one space and then they can pick just a colored mm. thing. So I don't know if I have just one space in there. It still yeah, clears me up. So. Interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Learning new things on Built On Air. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I'm just going to leave it as one space because why do three when you can just do one? <laughs> and I'm going to turn this on and now the other cool thing about that approach is if you had like default values you could use that automation to populate your default values oh definitely absolutely and then let's see I, if i want to be able to add the tasks now from my interface i'm just going to pull in my actions single select make that editable. And I also, I really like to make them large just because I think it looks better when it's filled in. Um, and then I'm going to just put in, usually I'll put, you know, add a task by setting the actions drop down to add task. Now, when I go to preview, did I turn this back on? Let's just make sure I did. And if I set this to add task, then we'll give it a couple of seconds. It might take a couple and there we go. So now we've got another app 
task added and this is set back to blank. So I could just keep doing this and adding a few tasks to the list. And then I can start filling them in. That is cool. So that's- Can you delete tasks from here? Could you delete a record? You can't delete it, no, but yeah. you could use the same hack if you put the actions on the task record and then you could have a delete uh, option. However, that's a little scary to me just because if somebody, I don't know, if, if there's nothing to check, like whether or not you actually want to delete the record and somebody sets it and they're like, oh, oops, I didn't mean to do that, then they've got to go back into the base and restore it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's really cool. And I mean, there's something to that drop down as well. Yeah, if you could add more, you could add like different types of tasks just straight from the drop down. Yeah, um, exactly. And make, go ahead. Sorry. I was saying you could use the conditional logics in the automation to branch based on the selection. Exactly. And Kavan um, took it way further where she had you know data validation and everything and when you went to go add a record with the drop down it might come back and print like in a formula field or maybe just a text field that they're dumping the error message into saying hey sorry that number isn't between zero and ten like it should be um so that was really brilliant i thought kavan if you're listening yeah, yeah. cool awesome that's a great that's a great use case Someday it may not be needed, but even, I mean, even there's more that you can do beyond just creating. So I think even just that approach um, has use case that I don't think, it, you know, that would be specific to your specific needs. So I think that strategy is keep worth keeping in your back pocket. Agreed. All right, moving on, scripting time. I'm gonna share, um, Let's see. So I'm going to share uh, a way a script. So this script actually comes from the marketplace. So th this isn't very highly promoted, but they actually do have kind of a, a script library or script marketplace. So if you go into the marketplace um, and click on the scripts, there's actually most of them were provided by Airtable, but they actually allow other people to submit and then they'll put them in here. They don't have a ton. It would be nice if this got, um, you know, if there was some incentive to put your scripts in here, I think the community would really benefit from having a robust scripting library here, but it's tough to support um, this. I know Kavan's got a couple, at least one in here, um, Alex, and a couple other people. The one I'm going to share is actually the newest one that I just noticed was in there. I don't know when this got um, added. Uh, looks like last year, October. So I haven't been here in a while. But I want to give a shout out to Robin uh, Engelbrecht, who submitted this. And we're going to look at this, going to help us improve our scripting skills. And this is kind of a cool little mini app that, that may be useful for you. And basically what it is, is it's a way to generate a bar chart in Markdown. And so it's kind of cool. It's a feature that I know, Ali, you use to use uh, emojis to, to demonstrate some kind of bar chart. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I've got it installed here. And I'll just show you first how it works. You just pick the table. You can filter it by view. You pick the uh, label name and then the value field. So the, So I'm just picking a project management. I'm using the same base that you chose and um, using a ranking field to determine that. So when I run this, it's just going to go through all of the items and it'll generate this, this chart um, that looks kind of nice. You can kind of visually see. So this isn't an actual, you know, charting app or anything, but it's kind of nice. It also displays the, the values over on the right um, and then the bar charts here. So let's look and see how this was built. So I'll just kind of walk you through the basics so you get an understanding of how scripting, especially if you're new to this world or if it's intimidating, hopefully this helps you get a little more comfortable, get, get the confidence to dive in here and um, learn some scripting. So this input.config, 
this is what generates that first form. If I go back to the settings, this generates this form here that allows uh, you to get input from the user kind of for configuration purposes. So you're just creating this array. So where you see these brackets, that's an array. That means there's multiple items. And then each one is um, some different type. So it's a view type or a label. Um, and you can pick a table or a view. And um, so now this, or it can be just text input. You can, you, there's a couple of things that you can do for input. They don't have a date field yet. They need to definitely add a date amongst other things. Yeah. Um, they do have like a drop down and a couple other things like that. So that will get input. And then now you can use whatever. Um, the cool thing is, is they don't show this to you every time. So it's the first time. And then after that, then you have to click on the settings to view that. Um, so it kind of remembers what the user inputted. And was, then, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I was just, I have to say, I love that. And I hate that because if the user picks a field that doesn't work for the inputs and there's no way to limit what they can choose, they could choose any field, mm -hmm. then, then it fails if they get an error. And then it's not super obvious that they have to go back and click that settings gear to go back and change the inputs that they chose. And that for that reason alone, I never use script settings. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah, there isn't a way to filter it based off of the type or anything. Yeah, that would be nice. I mean, you can definitely, you know, put in the description must select this type, but People don't read instructions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. So going through this, let me hide this, give a little bit more room. So if you see here, all of these are, um, um, so all of these are functions. So when it's defined as a function, it won't actually execute until you actually call this function. So I'll show how these are called. Um, Familiar face, Camille, joining us. Definitely date field is needed. Um, and so we see here, and then you'll see these async. This is important to know. So in JavaScript, has a way where it can kind of run things in the background. Um, that's that's actually like the default way that that Airtable or that um, JavaScript does things, but that's not always what you want. And so if you don't want it to run um, in the background and you want it to, you want to wait until that function is done, then you have to use this concept of async and await. And so every function that if you're using any of Airtable's functions, like the select records or anything on the, on the table to modify the, the data, you're going to need to put an await in front of it. So that basically says, wait here until this function is completed before you move on. Otherwise, there's another way that you could do it, um, but I don't recommend it. Um, and so unfortunately, just JavaScript was built this other way first. Most people, especially now, use it kind of this synchronous approach way where you use await and async in most use cases. Um, you know, it would be nice if that was kind of the, the first way to do it. And then if you needed the other way, there was a different way you could do it. But anyways, it is what it is kind of legacy. This isn't Airtable specific. It's JavaScript related, um, which is the language that Airtable uses. And so then when you call a function that has um, the async in front of it, you need to use await for it to run. So this is how you call a function. You have these, these uh, parentheses that tells it that you're executing this function. And sometimes a function like down here has parameters that's passing data into the function that's specific every time you, or that's different every time you call that function. This one here doesn't have any parameters, so you don't need to pass anything into it. So it's gonna generate the chart and it's basically, um, it's going to pull in all the records from the view that we selected and then it's going to um, and then it's going to iterate go through each one so this for each goes through every record and performs this inside function and now it's creating this um, array of bars that has a label and a view 
based off of our settings items of what we picked for our label field and our view. And then it outputs as markdown. So output is a Airtable script specific variable that is globally defined. So if you're use, usually you have to define a variable like this output, you don't have to, it's already kind of like there for you to use. And it's a way to push to the screen to um, generate UI text out there. And it supports markdown. And so you see here inside of here, this is kind of like a catch all way to run two functions in the same line. Um, they're calling this bar charts to generate the markdown that then gets sent to their and I'm not gonna go through, that's kind of, you know, and then this, um, they actually borrowed from uh, this GitHub repository. So it's basically all that, all the logic. This gets definitely more complex. Um, so this is maybe a bit more advanced to actually generate the UI for this kind of bar chart. Good thing is, is the developer community is, is very uh, friendly and willing to share a lot of code samples like this. So a lot of times you might be able to find this, like this person um, is not the person who wrote this code, somebody else did and they shared it and, and open sourced it um, for others to, to use. So shout out to Worm, who is this GitHub repository who shared that as well. And so, but if you wanted to change like what emoji was used on there, so I just wanted to see what it would look like if I change that. So right here, this bar chart right here, there's a little bit of configuration. So there's the, the emoji that they use. So if I change that to uh, something else, let's, let's do a rock sign. Dig <laughs> it. I don't think I actually tried this. This won't display as nice because it's a little bit bigger, right. but you could use a different emoji by changing um, that character there, put a different emoji in and um, yeah, play with it there. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into scripting and how you can use it. I think it's kind of a, a must have to do complex stuff, it really allows you to, to really take advantage of, of Airtable. And um, you can also do scripting inside of automations, which is also very powerful. So either an app or an automation that allows you to do so much more. Um, so worth checking out, worth learning JavaScript and how you can use it in Airtable to perform what you need to do. So that uh, is scripting time. So one quick shout out to the Built on Air community. Um, we just last week, let me see if I can share, I'll go back to our Slack community. And if I go to the general, you look, we we're at 1,005 users. So last week we passed the thousand mark. So shout out to all those who joined. We also did an announcement. Um, that uh, for the thousandth user, um, we threw them some Airtable credits as kind of a thank you for the for the thousandth person that came in. And for all uh, built on air users, uh, Ontair is donating twenty five dollars towards your next purchase. So if you are thinking of using Airtable, use um, built on air one thousand for a twenty five dollar um, credit towards your next purchase. So thank you to the community. It's been amazing to interact with everybody. Um, we're now at a thousand and, and hope to grow to thousands more. So we love to um, interact with you on the Slack community and whatnot. So happy to share that. <clears throat> Finally, I've been pushing it for a few weeks and we had a good week last week. We had uh, quite a few sign up. So. All right, we're gonna end with an Airtable question. And I saw Scott was with us, but had to run for a appointment. So he's no longer with us, but I need to give him credit. He actually shared this on um, with, uh, with a experts group. That's a private group inside of Airtable. If you are a consultant or an expert, and uh, we do have a, a kind of private group that, that meets and, and shares insights within the built on air community so if you are interested in joining that as an expert 
Um, we have a open um, <clears throat> group coming in in a few weeks, so we might be able to get a few more into that. But anyway, Scott posed the question, and then he answered it himself. So credit to Scott here. But he asked the question in um, automations. How do you determine who gets the email when something happens? Inevitably, Air, uh, Airtable automations break. They do seem to be a little, little bit more stable. Have you have you felt that way? I have. I used to get a lot of errors just yes. saying that something timed out or an unknown error occurred. And I have been getting far less of those lately. So that's good. Yep. Yeah. So, um so the question is, is who gets that email? Because if, you, if you've built any kind of air, uh, automation in Airtable, there's no way to configure like a meta setting on like who gets emails. There's nothing in the account settings of who gets automation emails. So it's kind of this black box. Mm -hmm. So we're able to reveal a little bit of that black box. So Scott reached out to the Airtable support and they actually answered him. And they told him that uh, I always assumed that it was whoever created the automation would mm -hmm. get the alerts because uh, that was my experience. Right. But it turns out that it's actually whoever turns the toggle on. So if you are building it for somebody else, so if you're a consultant or you're a team member, but you, you, you're not the one that wants to receive the automations, after you test it, tell whoever, whatever user should get the emails, just have them come in and turn it on. And then that's what Airtable support said is who will get the email notifications when, when something breaks. Um, so that's really good to know. I, I didn't know that. So I learned something new today. <laughs> Same. Yeah, that's really yeah. good. I, I wonder, I guess the only question I have, and maybe I could probably test it is several times when I'm on with a client, they might have invited me to their base just for like the hour that I'm working with them. And then they'll remove me to so that they don't get a continuous charge. And I wonder if if I turned an automation on, and then they remove me, right. does it default then back to them? Does, or does no one get the emails? That is a good question. Yeah, that's another black box. <laughs> <laughs> We'll have to uh, test that. Yeah, we'll have to test, like create a automation that always breaks so we can <laughs> test that. We, maybe we'll do that as an experiment. Um, yeah, I do notice like that. that's like, um, you know how you can make a, a view be um, specific, a personal view. Mm -hmm. I, I've seen it where that so, somebody, it's a personal view. It still shows up as a personal view to the, to the owner of the base. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see those, but I've seen it where that person is no longer a user in the base and the view is still there. And it's like a ghost owner no. and you can't change who the owner of that view is. Like you can't revert it because you're not that user. And so I've had it where I've had these views and I had like automations tied to those views and you couldn't, you have to like recreate it. Um, so that, and, but you can't delete them either because you're not the owner. So that's that, so that interesting. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure that's probably been going on for a while then. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that on the views that, that that was and maybe it's fixed. I honestly haven't checked in a while. That that was at least a year ago when when I was dealing with that issue that I remember. <laughs> so yeah, so that that that's definitely something. Probably one of the bad things of not being able to you know have kind of a, a top level control over who is the owner of automations or who gets the alerts and similar with views. The owner of the base should be able to change you know, who the owner of a view is, especially if that user has left. <clears throat> right. So lots of things that under the hood um, might need to, maybe if you reach out to support, they can, uh, <clears throat> okay, Camille is giving some insight here. So maybe they've improved that. Owners can reassign personal views now. Awesome. Um, Learned something new. <laughs> I did know that. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. 
Good. Thank you, Camille, for that. So helping each other in the community to learn how to use Airtable best. That's what we do here at Built on Air. Glad you could join us. And um, we will be back next week. I do want to give one more shout out. Uh, I almost forgot. If you want to meet Ali and myself and many others, Camille and Hannah and and many others I know will be at the Dare Table Conference April 8th and 9th. And um, I was speaking with Chris, who may be joining us next week to tell us a little bit more about the Dare Table Conference. But he did share with us a coupon code for the Built on Air community. So if you are thinking of going, you can get 40% off with using Built on Air 40 as your coupon code. So I believe that gets the price down to $150, which is not bad for a conference. Um, so we would love to meet anybody that's planning to come. Uh, we will do a live show from there and talk to as many people as we can. I think that will be a lot of fun. In April, it's in Austin, Texas. So hopefully we'll see many of you there. Please come up to us and let us know. All right. We will see you all next week and love to hear what you are building on air. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for joining today's episode. We hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to check out our sponsor, ontair.com. And we will see you next time on the Built on Air podcast.